I wrote a book about the future I want to imagine and want to contribute towards. And um, the reason for that was to, to clarify for myself primarily whether we can, we can achieve this. This being 10 billion people living on the planet in balance with the planet and equally wealthy on all five levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And yes, I absolutely know that this is doable. Thomas Schindler is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. A childhood dominated by dinner table conversations around ion channels, power micro microscopy, nuclear war, and ecosystem collapse left its marks. Instead of becoming a rock star, which had been the original plan, Thomas became an entrepreneur driven by applying the power of science and technology towards making the planet a good place. This led to a series of for-profit and non-profit organization initiatives, projects towards that objective, which have been explored on this website, on his website, thomas.cr. Thomas is also the author of a couple books, which we will discuss in our podcast today, Mother and Jungle Factor, and has a wonderful TED Talk, a TEDx Frankfurt Talk, an economy that grows a happy planet instead of happy money. Thomas is also a very good friend of mine, and we've known each other for a while, and welcome, my friend. It's so good to see you. Thank you, Mark, for having me on the, on the, on the show. It's amazing. Um, You're absolutely welcome. And, and thank you for giving me the shorter version of your biography. You have been around the block and done many things over the years. So I know I could not just, you, you actually left your books and your TED Talk off of there. So I could have went on with many other fabulous organizations and things you've done over the years, people you've helped, but really, um, not only do you want the happy planet, but you also like to make people and organizations happy in your interactions with them and giving them a different vision of the future and the possibilities for mm. a good planet. Is, is that, am I getting it right? I think you're getting it right, yes. Um, and I think the word good is, is, a, is a critical component in there. And, and I also think that the, the reason why there's not so much to talk about um, in the past because I like to be biased towards the now and the future more than the past and, uh, and the now. But <clears throat> picking up on the, on the good, uh, I like saying um, I'm trying to contribute towards making the planet a good place. Um, I say good deliberately. I got that from Isabella Allende. So most, most of the things I say, by the way, aren't um, my inventions. I just put, might put them together in, in, in new ways, but um, I am inherently lazy. So um, I, I build on the shoulders of giants. And, um, and this one is, um, is uh, Isabella Allende who said, better an increment is actually not an option. A better world is not an option. We have to build a good world. And the way I like to describe that is 14,000 kids under the age of five dying every day from preventable causes would be better because that's 1,000 less than today. But is it good? Mm -mm. Right. Yeah, it's so, only this, like I've said before, this going slower in the wrong direction. Yeah, correct. Type, type of thought process, correct? Correct. Absolutely. Right. And, and talking about what's good forces you to 
or trying to move toward what's good forces you to ask the difficult question of what that actually means. And that changes something in your, in your mind, in your, in your behavior. And then you're tied into that future of the good future, which gives you the um, possibility to act differently today. So in the best sense of live in the future and build what's missing, I'm trying to live in, a, in, the, in the future that I want to see and then by acting in the now, I see and feel what's, what's missing and try and, and, and contribute towards making that happen. But also I, the way you were describing it, um, creating, creating uh, happiness in the, in the deepest uh, sense, I think is a key component of the future. And, um, and that's why I try and, 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 and do that. You have um, been doing this, like I said, for quite some while. You've had this mm -hmm. thought process that started early in, in childhood. And, and like I mentioned, you've, you've done the books, you've uh, owned the companies, you've consulted for different organizations. Mm -hmm. I know, but my listeners don't know how, how you've weathered this pandemic, but has any of that past experience um, helped you get through this period better? And what has that looked like? And can you kind of catch us up to speed if, uh, how, how it's been for you? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think there's several um, things I'd like to, um, describe to, to set the stage for how this experience is and was for me. Um, one is that um, for the past uh, 20 years and more, I've been busy building organizations and um, building stuff from scratch is always a bit like... Um, like falling, right? Um, you, you're trying to, to assemble the airplane um, in midair while you're falling, something like this. I try to, um, I, what I've learned over time is that I'm actually not building the airplane, but that I am flying already. It's just my idea that there's a ground that I'm falling towards that I might hit that is scary. But once you understand that there's actually no ground and that everybody is falling at the same rate, you can experience, you can change your experience of falling and the scary experience of falling as flying, which is a, a totally different perspective, but you're still doing the same thing. So that's something that's um, been instilled in within me over time uh, through that tough training of building um, organizations and um, often failing and sometimes succeeding um, that has given me a tool to look at situations like the pandemic in a different way. The other component is that I expect catastrophes like this on a much, much larger level in the not so far future. So from that perspective, um, I, can, I can see this as a training exercise. This is pop, I mean, we, we, we're not sure how it will pan out. Maybe there is much, much more physio physiological harm done in the brain through COVID-19, which we don't know of yet. So it's a, probably a bit early to say, but um, saying it hyperbolically, this is, the, this is the softest possible training exercise for humanity. And I'm thankful for it. I mean, there's a lot of harm and um, I totally acknowledge that. And um, 
I have lost the friends uh, in, in that pandemic, um, but um, it could have been so much worse. And so these two factors combined um, actually created a situation where I was uh, almost enjoying it because all of a sudden people like um, in our bubble all around the world not, uh, that were in their sub bubbles started connecting in, in, a, in an entirely new way. And, and I feel something emerging out of that that is powerful and that can help um, the people that are ex having, having traumatic experiences right now and will have even more traumatic experiences in the next catastrophe or crisis to step beyond that and, and uh, start using that as a, as a potential into building a new reality. So I have to ask, and maybe we'll get into a deeper uh, rabbit hole with this question. Are, are you telling us that we need to prepare for the apocalypse, the dystopian future, you know, get the gas masks and the spacesuits ready? And, um, or are you telling us that, uh, that through this experience, we'll have a different type of resilience and the future will look different regardless of, of those pandemics. What, what exactly are you saying? You're saying, is it optimistic? Is it hopeful or, oh shit, here comes the apocalypse and let's get the, the bunker in, in, in the mountain and, and uh, that's, that's going to be the future. Okay, so I think there's um, two things going on at the same time right now. Um, and we tend to tend to mix them. The one thing is that we have reached a point of cultural complexity through globalization, through mainly through globalization, but, but um, uh, through technology, etc. that is breeding a new perspective on the world. And this new perspective on the world is popping up in different places and shapes and experimenting and trying to come to life. And we don't know yet what it is, but it's, um, we know it's going to happen. And some people call it the awakening and the, the global consciousness and whatever it is, um, it wants to come out and it is going to come out. And that's a massive transformation on a societal global level. And at the same time, we have, um, and by the way, the, the first thing is, I believe, wonderful and absolutely positive. Um, it's the next step in the mimetic evolution of mankind. Um, the, on the other hand, we have burned 100 million years worth of trees in the last hundred years to bring a portion of humanity into um, well wealth on at least the two lower levels on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm not sure about the upper layers. Um, and destroyed large portions of um, our home uh, to, the, to the point that there's ecosystem collapse happening right now. So these are the two competing elements um, that we often tend to overlap. And that's not so, just the, the capitalistic organization's way of doing their own version of Burning Man, or is that, uh, you know, uh, um, are you saying that, that, that they're eventually going to be recourse from that or, or you know, it's, it's basically yeah. a geoengineering yeah. experiment that they've done on, on a much mm. different, different scale, right? Well, so yeah, so, so to go deeper into the, the, the question of why we brought ourselves to ecosystem collapse um, is very much tied into systemic, um, a systemic configuration 
that um, we've created over the past couple of hundred years and that has um, led to a point in 71, uh, which I believe is absolutely fundamental and crucial, um, which is a point where we set up our most fundamental system of economic exchange money um, to be self-serving. So we, we have created a system where we need to create money in order to keep, keep money stable. And um, in order to create more money, everything go, anything goes, right? So, so this is um, in order to create more GDP, people in order to create more GDP it's in it's okay to 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 externalize um, uh, to have negative externalities um, that um, are too expensive to cover anymore by uh, by society um, and this is what is system systemically moving us um, towards ecosystem collapse is actually a reward system for exploitation um, that is a fundamental systemic problem. And um, any, everybody I speak with um, doesn't want that, right? It's, like, it's a bit like the, the discussion about um, a, a, a um, general uh, intelligence. Um, we're afraid of that machine that um, will be smarter than us and growing faster than us and learning faster than us, etc. Well, we've already built a version of that um, by de 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 designing the monetary system in the way we have. So we're locked into that. Just to give a, give a brief example, um, I've, I've had, a, had the pleasure of spending a weekend with uh, um, the, the, the 20 people from a board uh, of directors of a, of a um, very, very large um, engineering company in, in, in Germany. Um, and, uh, and part of that, um, that weekend, we did uh, an Ikigai exercise to identify the, their individual um, reason for being. And so one question in the Ikigai Venn uh, diagram idea is that um, you have to answer the question, what does the world need? Now you have the typical 20, 50 plus white male guys. And I asked them, okay, so what does the world need? And they went through a process and um, then they came back with an answer. And the answer was love. So I, I see and feel that everywhere. Wherever I speak with people, people want to get to the same, same mountaintop, right? The this, this same summit. They see the same thing. Um, it's just hard to get there in a world that is not set up for that systemically. So, so that's, that's the one end. The other end is the, is the question of, um, okay, through, through all of this complexity, something new is emerging. And there might actually be a fit there might actually be a fit in the way this new thing is emerging and the problems we need to solve. Right? So, and and what's, what's we're exploring and what is being propelled by the current um, situation of the pandemic as a global conversation is, what does that look like? And I, there are, I, currently I'd li I like, I like putting it in the following terms. There's five possible rough directions of the future. Um, there's extinction for mankind. Um, there's um, uh, what I call Mad Max lo-fi, which is basically what you see in the Mad Max movies. Very so people dystopian. Dystopian, people competing based on the scarce resources. Um, then there's what I call Mad Max high-tech, uh, which could be something, a mixture between Mad Max and Matrix, like people running the Matrix to enslave everybody else. Uh, another dystopian scenario. Then there's Star Trek high-tech, um, which is Star Trek, 
right? Uh, we use a lot of technology to, to um, bring everybody onto uh, uh, an amazing level of knowledge and, and prosperity and all of it. And then there's what I call Star Trek low tech. Um, and I believe that um, it is possible to create a Star Trek low tech future with a high tech option. So what, 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 what do I mean? Um, let's take the example of an earth ship. So an earth ship as an off grid building built with um, essentially the materials you find most, more or less um, works on with the fundamentals of physics. So, so the, the, the air, cool air comes in at the back bottom and hot air leaves at the highest point, which is at the, also at the hottest point. So you have a natural ventilation. You just have to open a window. Now you can open that window manually or you can have sensors and actuators to open those windows uh, at some thresholds. That's what I call Star Trek low tech with high tech option. If the sensors break because there's a solar flare and um, all of the electric, electric, electric systems um, uh, uh, fry, no problem. We can just open and close it like that. Um, so setting up, uh, thinking in these terms and setting up a society that um, works on the, the Star Trek low-tech uh, um, channel, the idea, the perspective, um, from the ground, resilient enough to be able to do without high technology. It's um, the, the Star Trek is very science fiction, but the, the, and tell me if I'm wrong, the, the high tech option, is it really only there because you and I or others are uncertain whether the infrastructural grid of a renewable future of, of technology that is Star Trek or sci-fi or futuristic may not make it to the future to be there to, to give us that transition. And if we go beyond the limits to growth or have bigger collapses or problems with climate or whatever it may be, unrest, um, refu conflict refugees or climate refugees, whatever may influence that, that we have the manual regular Star Trek low version. Is that kind of it, it, that's, uh, also that's, the thinking? That's the thinking, yeah. And um, <clears throat> so, so I'm, I'm currently, in my mind, currently there's a, there's a, there's a picture evolving of um, uh, how to manifest that. And there's a, there's a second component to the high tech in there. So we might want some high tech but that high tech is a different form of high tech than we're currently used to or are generally referring to when we say high tech. It's more a material sciences high tech. So what if, what if humanity becomes a seafaring species? Right? So <clears throat> let's just imagine for a moment that we manage to invent something like a floating island that holds a couple of hundred people that is fully self-sustaining and by definition doesn't want to pollute the environment because that will feed directly back in. If you pollute the, the body of water you're sitting on, then you will ingest that. <laughs> um, directly. And so you don't want that. So, so um, you have a, very, really, really strong um, motivation to, to be um, uh, sustainable. So can we build something like this that's um, self-sustaining and sustainable in a way that it can scale up to 10 billion people? If we can create this in, a, in, a, in a, a one 
small island for 300 people, uh, we, can, we can scale this up. We can configure this into villages and cities and um, et cetera. We can move it into the parts of the world that are more habitable because of the temperature and, uh, and, and, and storms, et cetera, um, that will become more unpredictable and, and definitely will move over the planet in, in new ways that we, that we don't uh, know yet and cannot really predict. Um, so we're, we're geoflexible um, as a species. And, um, but we don't know where we will get the materials from to make that sustainable for 10 billion people. So my, my hunch is that um, there's not only a, a massive opportunity, but also um, if we, we think in these terms of if, if, if we create these types of um, artificial constraints, then we can say, okay, so we need something that's through and that shields us from the environment, like a window. Somebody somewhere in history um, tested what happened if you, if you heat up sand too much and it turned into glass. But as the, is that the only material out there that, that we can use to, to, to provide a window? Probably not, right? Maybe we find a clever way of growing windows out of the material we have in the sea. I don't know. I'm pretty sure we can. If we ask that question, to science, right? So it becomes a function of asking the right questions. Asking the right questions from society, from scientists, from politicians, from, from entrepreneurs, from, from everybody. And how do you ask the right questions? You ask the right questions by creating an image of something worth living. You can say, okay, what do we need to get there? Let's build it. So I believe what you're saying in many respects is that there are a lot of tools and facets that we could um, reach out for. One is the, the earth ships, uh, one is seasteading. Um, uh, some other ones that, that I have in mind are, are going vertical, better efficiency of land and space usage. But I'm also hearing something else out uh, and I want to I want to make sure I'm hearing it right, or if I understand it correctly. Are you saying that if we have 10 billion, 9 billion, um, 11 billion people in the future, that no matter what, there's not enough resources on our planet to sustain all those? Or maybe I should throw in this caveat. Do you believe that there is a way to live within uh, our finite resources and within planetary boundaries and still have those numbers and the population in the future if we use some form of circular economy and new methods of efficiency or ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <clears throat> um, as you mentioned, and uh, I wrote a book uh, about the future I want to imagine and want to contribute towards. And um, the reason for that was to, to clarify for myself primarily whether we can, we can achieve this, this being 10 billion people living on the planet in balance with the planet and equally wealthy on all five levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And yes, I absolutely know that this is doable. So if you just, just for example, if you look at um, the, the required area of, of land to feed a person, whether you do that horizontally or vertically, plus comfortable space for living, plus comfortable space for recreation outdoors, 
at least according to my math, um, and even if I'm wrong, it's still ridiculously small in comparison to the potential we have. We could comfortably put the entire human species in the space of Europe. No problem. Feed everybody everything. So, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's just in our minds, the way we, the way we think about, you say circular economy, um, the, the Thai king said um, sufficiency economy. Yep. All right, so. King Ram the Ninth <laughs> said that. Yeah, the sufficiency economy uh, uh, plan. Yeah. yeah, end of 90s, right? So, so he said, okay, it's, it's pretty ridiculous that um, out of all people, farmers go hungry. Really? So what if we put the well-being of our people first? Forget about import and export and all of that. Well, who needs that, right? What we need is small communities that care for each other, that ensure that everybody has a good life. And then we can scale from there and make sure that the entire country is self-reliant sufficiency economy. It's the country can de be detached from the entire world and it still functions. Are and you talking about mother book or jungle? Mother. Mother. Um, so, so mother is an experiment that, that um, uh, came out of another experiment, uh, which, which I started a couple of years ago, which is a series of uh, books that aren't published for a very simple reason. They provide a safe space for the participants. Um, these are called 50 Years Hence. And um, the reason why they're called 50 Years Hence is because this guy, Winston Churchill, sat down in 1932 to imagine what the world sh could look like in, in 1982. And in super strange images, he came up with things like vertical farming and solar, solar energy and, and gene editing and stuff we didn't have in 82, but shortly thereafter, or some of this stuff. So I was curious about what do other people imagine the future could and should look like? So I started asking people about that. And then we put uh, those essays into a book, which were only shared among the authors. And after a while, um, I thought, okay, I, I have a feeling that there's something common in all of these essays, but it's really, really hard to go into that exercise and really describe what the world could, should look like in, in 50 years. So let me sit down and, and try to, 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 to get down into that nitty gritty because that's what we have to do. Otherwise, we don't know what we have to build. And that's why I wrote Mother. And, um, and to do that, I had to find a way of describing all aspects of, of um, the human condition in a way that um, the aspects are distinct enough from each other, but overlapping enough so, so, so that there's a, an understanding that, yes, we're covering everything. And I settled on, on six questions, which are now also guiding uh, a platform that uh, we've built around 50 years hence to get even more ideas about um, what, the, what the future might look like. And these, these questions are, how do we organize supply? Which is the question around the ec economy. But um, I put this on an abstract level to, to allow the thoughts to become bigger. Because at the moment we, supply essentially says, how do we find stuff that we can then put into useful stuff and distribute it to people, right? There's no rule in the book that says we have to use money and companies to do that, right? The function is to support everyone. So how do we do that? And then how do we structure society, which is a question around governance. We tend to defend democracy at the moment, 
but maybe our configuration of democracy at the moment isn't really what we need. Maybe there's a better version of democracy. At the moment, France um, and some other countries as well are experimenting with notions that are borrowed from um, the, the, our, our original template for, for democracy, which is ancient Greece, which was entirely different. We didn't have parties or there was no voting, right? So, so but still it's considered democracy. Um, how do we manage knowledge? How do we actually come to the conclusion that something is knowledge? How do we agree on that? How do we distribute it across language barriers, cultural barriers, etc.? How do we relate to people? How do we nurture the body? Right? So at the moment, uh, there seems to be something broken. If you dig down into the, the food industry, it's, um, I'm, I'm far from being a, a, a conspiracy theorist, but it, 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 it could look like the food industry is set up to feed the pharmaceutical industry um, because uh, it is essentially making us sick and the pharmaceutical industry is keeping us sick because they're set up in the same way. Right? Is that a good way? Probably not. So, and then last but not least, how do we mind the spirit? Which is to say, what is that stuff that's more than the sum total of our atoms? And how do we deal with it? And this is also in an abstract, in abstract terms because we, regardless of whether you're a um, natural scientist with an atheist background or whether you're a fundamental Christian, um, you agree on the fact that there's something more than the sum total of your atoms. So how do we deal with that stuff? So these are the six leading questions and um, I have a lot of fun and it's very interesting to, ha to have these conversations with people all around the planet around these six questions. Because essentially, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And it's somewhat somehow tying back into the, these managers that found love as the most important thing that the world needs. People come up with very similar ideas, very similar. They might have different images and words and different, slightly different perspectives. And it might be more tech or less tech or more, but essentially what people are looking for is a community close to the Dunbar number that is self-sufficient and that is also interconnected with other communities, preferably around the globe. Well, this, you, you probably answered like all of my questions already in one way or the other, but we're going to get more in, into specifics of that. Uh, you, you uh, one of my questions is about globalization. We touched yeah. upon that early on. You and I both did a workshop together, a moonshot mm -hmm, mm -hmm. workshop together in Lake Como, a beautiful place, um, um, type of a castle or a nice historical house as setting mm -hmm. on Lake Como. And uh, it was basically a moonshot about what the future is, thinking about the future, how to plan and think and, and get there, how to um, mm -hmm. run scenarios out to, to achieve that. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We had some wonderful conversations there. So we, we've been thinking about this for a long time. We've been working about it. You've been writing about it. You've, you've asked yourself the hard questions. And mm. that's why I, I wanted to really know, has that helped you in this time? The, the answer that I hear out very easily is that, yes, you've been put in a better place to advise and bring uh, groups of people together from all over the world, people have reached out to you. You've also felt the heartache and, and death and suffering of, of people who have been touched uh, uh, personally from the pandemic, but that you have yourself been pre prepared in a better, more resilient way to, to weather through this. It's seen as a very 
uh, positive way because not only through this pandemic, more people mm. are awakened, more people mm. are uh, saying, holy hell, what do I do? And now how, how can I be better prepared the next time, which you're saying there, there will be some next times. Mm. Am I getting it right a little bit? How, mm -hmm. how I'm hearing that out? Because uh, we know each other better so and, and speak often. Um, it's uh, something so, I kind of wanted my listeners to know as well, but also mm -hmm. I have access to your calendar. You have access to mine. We're so hard to get a hold of it and so busy all the time. So I really know it's, I mean, normally people would say, wow, this has been like a, 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 a forced vacation, you know, now mm -hmm. I get to be in my own, my own human zoo, my own prison, mm -hmm. but we've mm -hmm. created something a little different for ourselves. Um, so yeah, I, I, I um, remember that uh, um, our our meeting in Lake Como very well, especially our ride afterwards uh, around the lake uh, for hours in that in that bus, the six of us, and having the most amazing deep conversation um, I've had the entire year. I think um, it was really, really, really good, um, and. Um, building on 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 the on these images that you that you put <laughs> into my mind with with that with that um, gathering um, in that beautiful location, <clears throat> I think that um, well, it, it, I, I wouldn't say that the situation has helped me so much but I've, I've i've seen something that i think is important so the work you and mika and and uh, yussi and harald and uh, are doing around the moonshot or manuel is doing with future modeling or what i'm uh, doing with 50 years hence trying to come up with these broad big pictures that uh, give us a compass a compass in the in the best um, uh, Jack Sparrow-ish sense, right? So the compass that shows us where we want to go, right? It's very, very crucial. Um, and so that's an absolutely vital piece that um, more and more people are beginning to understand. Um, and I really don't understand the, the, the social uh, dynamics behind why that happens in this pandemic. My um, my guess um, is that there is a kind, kind of like a um, okay. There's a, there's a big pun now, but um, uh, zoom in and zoom out happening, right? <laughs> um, big pun for sure. Yeah, yeah. but um, but the fact that that we're um, sitting in our homes at the same time connected to the world and experiencing firsthand for the first time a global crisis, a real true global crisis that has personal individual effects, forces you to become more clear about yourself, but also to zoom out and look at the world. Right? So, so that's, and zooming out and looking at the world forces you then to, to come up with questions or answers on, so how do we do this differently? That's number one. Um, number two, there's um, this is overwhelming to most people because now you're sitting here, you're clear about yourself, but you're also very, very scared um, and you feel helpless and powerless because you're Im embedded and enmeshed in a system. And then the question becomes, so how do we deal with that system? How do I even start to understand that system? How do, can I attempt to understand that system? And that is the reason why we or I came up with jungle to provide a framework that helps you map a system, create a rough map of, of a system that you that you're looking at, and then 
knowing where your moonshot is, knowing where you want to go, start moving towards that. And while you're moving, measuring where are you going in the right direction? Is this a good path? In a, in a system that you don't know yet, that you're exploring. And, and why is that important? It's a, it's a tool that takes some of the risk out of being free for change, right? Because we, we've, we've um, created a culture for ourselves where we tend to be more free from stuff, free from fear and, and, um, and dangers of any kind. And um, we've, we're, we employ um, politicians to protect that and to manage that freedom from fear for us. But that bubble is bursting. So we need to become free for stuff that we're exploring, but that's not for the faint of heart because that can fail, right? So, so what, we, what, we, what we do with Jungle is we try and provide a tool that helps you move from being free from fear to be free for solutions. That's beautiful. You, um, and I don't know, we can edit this out if you don't want me to touch upon it, but so you, you weathered it fairly well th through this, this pandemic time, but I must say I was invited to your honeymoon. So you were supposed to have your honeymoon during this pandemic. So that, uh, through a big personal, uh, emotional, beautiful time for you, uh, uh, basically on hold because we couldn't travel anymore. Um, mm -hmm. Do you want to say anything about that? And, yeah, that's, and... that's, uh, that's actually the, um, apart from uh, the death of one friend, uh, the only real negative effect this um, has on me um, because <laughs> Vanessa and I got married in, end of March, not 29th. That's an important date for us. Um, so we did stick with that. Um, uh, but the 100 people that we'd invited to the party around it um, just couldn't come. Right? We, we, we had this beautiful uh, celebration set up in Costa Rica and um, nobody could get there. So we've, um, we hope um, that we can follow up on this uh, a year later. We've already reserved the same spot. Beautiful. Um, but we haven't seen each other in four months, except zoom yeah. in, zoom out, right? So, um, and so I'm, I'm flying out there in a week, um, which is the first possible date. So, so I'll, I'm allowed in, in the country um, starting 1st of August. I'll be flying on the 2nd. Um, but that's, that's been tough, yeah. Oh, I believe it. I believe and that's, that's also created um, a plan <laughs> between, between my son and, and myself. Um, we've, been, we've been spending our, our, this, his school holiday um, going around with our little boat. And now our plan is to prepare ourselves to be able to cross the ocean with a sailboat. Oh, um, that's beautiful. Because uh, even if we cannot fly anymore, um, we will probably have more time. Um, and uh, so crossing the ocean for a couple of weeks um, isn't so relevant anymore. And then I can still be geoflexible um, uh, without polluting. So that's, that's what came out of it. You truly have a beautiful family. I love Noah and, and uh, Vanessa, and I'm excited to, to be there. The, the reason I go into that even more is um, to address the global citizen question. So mm. uh, do you feel like you're a global citizen? Do you, uh, I want to know what your feelings would be like if uh, in the near future, we would remove borders, nations, limitations, restrictions, holding us and separating us from 
one another. You know very well, my father's American, my mother was German, my grandfather was German, my grandmother was Austrian, I have family all over the world and businesses. Um, we are all global citizens and, and, and whether that's a bad term or not, in some respects, there's multicultural uh, different languages that are married and together and yet we're still dividing ourselves in this world. Can you kind of give me some insight of your thoughts and feelings on that? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so I mean, I'm, I'm global from the, um, from the get go. I was, I was uh, born to Germans in um, California. Um, I grew up all over Europe. Um, my first wife is South African. Um, my partner for life is Costa Rican. Um, so there's, uh, I'm all over the place. Um, and there is uh, some, some fear of some people that if we don't have any borders anymore, then people will start invading some countries. And uh, yes, there will be movement. But I think most people underestimate the, the, the value people give to the place they are and love and for the place and also for the people around them. So I think the people are more sticky in their places than we, than we assume. Um, and having that open situation, I believe will help create situations where the, the, the climate, the negative effects of the, of the um, ecosystem collapse and climate change can be mitigated um, wherever they still can be mitigated better on the local level, which means that um, people will essentially stay where they are. They don't want to leave their country. They grew up there. They, it's beautiful. There's a, there are a couple of people that are by definition geoflexible and want to, want to buzz around the, the, the globe and, and live in all uh, sorts of places. And it might even be that um, we would want to incorporate something like that into our cultural setup, where, um, where young people get the opportunity to move around and cross-pollinate ideas and genes. Um, and there's, there's a, um, I don't know, I know it for, for, for Germany, there was, there was this, this um, tradition in, for carpenters. Once they had um, uh, uh, finished their, their education, they started roaming the land until they settled somewhere. Probably, usually, either because there was, they found a village where there was no carpenter or they fell in love or both. Um, and, and I think something similar could be very useful. So I think global travel could be an important thing also in the future, maybe at different speeds and for different reasons. Um, global understanding connectivity anyway. Um, um, I just recently, I, I, can't, I can't remember the name, but there's a, there's, there's a company trying to bring people to the edge of the atmosphere in balloons, um, de democratizing the overview effect. Yeah. Um, which I think is, could be actually very crucial <laughs> to the survival of humanity to understand that this is one thing. This is the, 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 the rich, um, Carl Sagan's pale blue dot. Right? It's looking at, at, um, at our planet from, from, the edge of our galaxy as this fragile little pale blue dot in the, in, in, in this vast nothingness. This is home, right? And once we grasp that, then borders don't make sense anymore. 
that really transitions over to um, the deeper, probably the first hardest question that I will ask you. I know you have the answer. Um, it's the burning question, WTF, and, and you know it's not the swear word. It's what's the future? Mm -hmm. So I am I'm convinced that once we either by force of catastrophe or by some um, nonviolent uh, um, transformation revolution that's happening, we will free ourselves from the gr systemic gridlock and amazing things will flourish. Um, and I, I referenced earlier the, the outcome of the, of the 50 years hence conversations. Um, the future, I mean, this is totally overused, but the future will be local and global. We, will, we live in local, self-sufficient communities at a very, very high level of well-being. That is entirely possible. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I know it can. That it is technically possible. And I want this future. The, the term... Uh Glocal mm -hmm. has already um, been out there, you know, not only Wikipedia, some dictionaries have accepted it, uh, you know, this global and local view. You, you mix that with the overview effect that you talked about, the balloons and having this cosmic perspective of our world from outer space. Uh, I, I believe that's emerging. I believe that we need to realize that we're all crew members on this spaceship Earth, that we can put our hands on the steering wheel, and no matter how small our actions, we can impact the, the future. And I, I do like when you say, you know, local and global. There is that uh, you understand your spot on the pale blue dot, and, and uh, you understand that there's the same air uh, we breathe is the same air in China and Germany and the U.S. and the same waters we drink and the same everything is mm -hmm. is all ours. It doesn't belong to one nation or border. So I, I really like that, and it is possible to do both or to 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 have both at the same time. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it's very um, uh, related to to your global hectare idea. It is. Um, and um, tra becoming a steward um, of the planet in, and, and, and more than that, a steward of the living conditions of future generations. I think that's, that could be the triggering point. There is a piece of like legislation that was um, put in place in Wales five years ago, which is called the Future Generations Wellbeing Act. And what that does is that political decisions have to prove that they, in, in several categories, have to prove that they actually will have a positive effect on the future well-being. Otherwise, they cannot be, 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 be um, executed. And there's an independent commission controlling for that. So what if we implemented that in Germany and then in Europe and then in other countries. What would that change? I think it would change a lot. And then, then we would become the steward of the future, which would then ask the question, what is the future we want for our kids and grandkids and their kids? And, um, and what is missing? And let's build that now. And I think that, that, will, that, will, that could be this catalytic event that um, unleashes all of the positive potential that is, is, is dormant and wants to come out but cannot at the moment. 
We, we've seen some experiments, not only with uh, my global hectare, um, but also with a universal basic income, you know, Spain and, and a couple of uh, Canada in some respects came out with some bailouts or some incentives that are very close broaching on universal basic income. I believe that if we had a, uh, a fair distribution of finite resources that it was an inalienable right for each individual and that through good stewardship we really showed that uh, we could not only be more efficient but live within planetary boundaries in this circular that there's some there's some wisdom and things in there that really would help us go far for future generations i mean to uh, sustainability sustainable is is been a big buzzword for a long time but what is it that means to sustain yourself your business your products your your yourself for future generations you know not just for one year but multiple years so i see a lot of people trying to start to really experiment with this and um and i mean i've, I've I'm part of a bubble that likes to, to think and talk and um, uh, do things about it. But my, my concrete next step is to really put myself into that position. So at the moment, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a buyer for, for the house in, in Berlin. And then we're going to get a ship to live on, fully self-sustaining to experiment with that. And also we're gonna build an earth ship in Costa Rica to understand how that actually works. I wanna know how that works because in theory it's all nice, but um, and I think that's, the, um, that's what I see emerging at the moment. There, there are more people that are trying to create these experience spaces for how does that actually feel? And what do I actually need? And, and then usually it turns out that it's not so much that, that, that we need and uh, that we can do very well without uh, most of the stuff. The one experiment some, everybody can easily <laughs> start today is something I started with my son five years ago. We stopped using single-use plastic. That's... That sounds big, but actually it's not that hard. But it's only not that hard if you're open to adapting your habits a little bit. And, and once you start doing that, you, you start noticing very interesting things. Like you will automatically <laughs> um, feed yourself in a much more healthy way because you cannot buy packaged food. So what do you buy? You buy vegetables and fruits, essentially. Now, what's bad about that? Roughly nothing, right? Um, yeah. so, so then you, then you notice, oh, I, the things I thought I needed, I actually don't need them. And, and then you can start experimenting with more and you start creating things yourself, um, I don't know, mundane things like baking bread or making your own soap. And so and then you can ask these questions. How do I make soap? Ah, there's some stuff in there that I cannot grow. I, can, I, I might be able to grow some olives and, and turn them into oil, but that's not enough. I need, I need some, what do you need? Uh, um, uh, Oh, for, very for alkaline, all, yeah, very alkaline. alkaline. Uh, so it's super hard to create that yourself. So um, I'd be very thankful um, if somebody um, came up with, a, with an easy solution to, 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 to create soap locally that I can create with my kid, um, just as a tiny example, right? But this is, um, or, or the beginning of the, of the pandemic, people went out to buy toilet paper. I don't know why exactly, because you could just get a hose pipe or a, a 20 buck thing that you can put on your toilet and turn it into a B-Day. Some people did that, but you need that image in your mind to be able to do it. And we did it because we, 
didn't get any toilet paper that wasn't wrapped in plastic. So we, we, we already had um, performed that change. But these are the little things, tiny little switches, and all of a sudden, your footprint goes to close to zero, right? Yeah. It's a, that, that's a beautiful way of, of looking at that. And I like that uh, you're experimenting, you're, you're thinking and pushing those those boundaries of how you can do that for yourself but with that resilience or that uh, um, the English word is, you know, self-sustaining in mm. German, it's a Überlebenskünstler or self-sustaining type of uh, lifestyle. You um, are put in a po unique position, not only to help your family, but then to show others what works and what doesn't there are a lot of examples out there of people seasteading or living on lakes you know uh, 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 different options there's uh, so many choices not just the sea there's tiny homes there's you know living off of the land there's uh, camping there's ton, tons of different uh, things out there that are very uh, much a step in, in that right direction now do we have to give all uh, creature comforts up to to live within our global hectare and to to do that? No, absolutely not. I, I believe that we can live a very fulfilling and rich and full life with plenty of food. And there's numerous examples out there. Uh, um, a lot of them are on the internet even now on the, the TikTok mm. craze. But um, we we really need to grasp fully the potential of that i want to touch on just one other thing you talked about food and how your transition has been in that but it ties really closely to a couple things you you mentioned the maslow's hierarchy of of needs a few times the bottom two layers of that uh the bottom layer is our physiological needs the breathing food and water which is mm -hmm. food which is more than food, it's our most basic earthly and human energy source. Food is a caloric intake, it regulates our body temperature, keeps the motor running so that we can stay at a certain heat to uh, survive and to have energy to do things. It's our, our energy and you know, uh, battery source, so to say. And then the second level is security of resources, security of body, um, that security of where we live and, and, and how we do that. During this time of pause of this great reset of this pandemic, one thing that has been a global citizen or had deep involvement on our whole planet was our energy source, was food, was still going in ships, still going in boats, still going in now in, in passenger airplanes. I saw them packing food and fruits and, and things into passenger airplanes. It's one thing that did not shut down. It cannot be shut down. And to cheapen food is to cheapen life because it is our most basic vital resource and energy source and so now when you lock down people when you don't allow them to travel when you restrict them to come into your country your nation if you build up walls and borders um, you're really doing a big huge damage to to humanity and our world and the way our world functions not only within that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you touched on many of those things. I, I, I think it's very vital to address that and put that into relation to what you've said and what possibilities there are to live more resiliently mm -hmm. and to live more sustainably in the future. Some things that you discussed were having this whether it's a collapse or a catastrophe happen that sh makes that push that nudge to get a mind shift a paradigm shift for humanity to start saying we need to change we need to do things differently so that we can be around for future generations and that really leads me to my second to last most 
scary question and you've uh, you've addressed it in some respects um, uh, during this but it's a little bit different um, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you mm -hmm. um <clears throat> Well, I have to build that um, on the assumption that um, everyone essentially at the core is concerned about the same thing. And that thing is ultimately the well-being of themselves and their loved ones. So the only way to think about um, that world for me is to find a way to maximize the um, well-being of everybody without exception. If it doesn't, if it cannot do that, then um, it's, not, it's not worth thinking about it. But it's even more complex because um, well-being to you and me, who are very similar in 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 our um, upbringing and uh, um, general uh, embeddedness in society, um, is might be something different from well-being for somebody else. So that also needs to be taken account for. And so that brings me back to this um, Star Trek low tech scenario where we enable ourselves to have local communities that are self-sufficient to a level where we're able to grow coffee and uh, pineapple in an area like, let's say, Berlin, right? Um, there are solutions out there to grow things like that within containers, running on sunlight with um, a small uh, um, footprint on water, um, there are solutions where you could have a greenhouse that you essentially put into the soil uh, with just a, a, a trans translucent surface on the top. Um, so you can regulate climate uh, through passive solar energy. So what I'm trying to say is the solutions are out there on, between the low and the high tech um, to grow the coffee we want around Berlin. No problem. That's so that's what that accounts for is that small communities can find ways to configure the way they, be, they think about well-being as a group while connected to all of the other little communities all around the globe. So it's like a, um, it's like a big index of communities and every community has, has its quirky specialities. Um, and they, because nobody has to compete for resources, they're all, uh, they can all leave each other untouched. But at the same time, you can go and experience and visit them and see whether you might like some of the quirkiness and, and um, bring it back home. Or if nobody wants your specific quirkiness, you can just set up camp somewhere else and maybe attract some people. Um, so... So it's very, very local, but at the same time, we can interact and have to interact and are asked to interact with all of them on the, on the entire planet to, to um, as a large global experiment of what works, what doesn't, how do we do things? And the only two real important aspects are 
maximizing of the personal individual wealth on all five layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs for everyone without exception. And implicit in that is care for the planet. That's the only true pools we need. And, um, and these are globally enforced by a community. Um, and we could go into the question of governance around that for hours. And um, like, like we already have uh, in, in other conversations, but um, this is a rough sketch of, um, of what, I, what I see possible, what I wish for. Um, yeah. Uh, we don't have too much more time, so I'm going to uh, try to wrap it up with these last two questions. But the, you, we've touched upon it um, several times during during our conversation. So Maslow's hierarchy of needs. You know that I'm a United Nations Sustainable Development Goal advocate, and that after I show the um, sustainable development goals in a wedding cake, a pie or a chart mm -hmm. type of a graph, then my very next slide is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I say they are for us and I liken them to uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, especially the bottom two, two layers. It's, um, they're very closely tied to each other. Mm -hmm. That with that knowledge and also knowing that we're limited on, on how much time we can have on this podcast, do you believe that there is a global plan out there for humanity to at least help us to reach 2030 or some plans out there that are unifiedly known that that people can work towards or to see as a guide that also fall in line to many of the things that you've said here today? <clears throat> so I haven't come across a clear plan yet that uh, people unify around. Um, I see islands, little ideas. Um, there's, there's of course the framework of the, of the SDGs. Um, and um, that is probably the, 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 the strongest um, and, and most prolific uh, uh, sort of plan, but um, I, I don't like uh, calling it a plan really. Um, I, it's a to-do list. And, and just like, so I'm, I'm, I'm a little wary about that to-do list because it could create a whole range of outcomes and some of them are more desirable than others. And I like thinking about what, are, what I'm cooking before I pull the recipe, right? Before I pull the to-do list. So I've, what is the world, what does the world look like with the SDG solved? Um, is the question that I'm missing. Um, and and I, understandably so, because it's probably the hardest question when, when, I, when I give my answer or even attempt an answer, um, I, I get all sorts of accusations about being uh, um, uh, a megalomaniac or um, uh, yeah, all sorts of negative things that, that people can call me. Um, but it's, I think there's a misunderstanding. It's not that I um, dogmatically say this is what, um, this is the world that we need to live in. It is what I currently believe is the world most worth living in. And this is my view and we can all have a conversation around that. And it, and so I don't see that conversation happening yet. I see bubbles. And um, as, I, as I said earlier, these bubbles seem towards, uh, heading towards the same summit. But there's no coherent plan. No, I don't see it. I have to disagree with you. I have to be <laughs> a little bit. We, we've known each other long enough, and you've heard me talk about it, that that vision that you don't see or that you don't feel about that there, you don't know what it'll look or feel like mm -hmm. December, 2030. 
when the SDGs or, or uh, the 15 year plan is, is finished. And for that specific reason, uh, you've probably heard me say this a few times, but there's a phenomenon that um, it's usually not until the fourth time that people say, damn, he's been saying it all along. I just didn't truly hear it until now. But for the sustainable development goals, I wrote the manifesto, mm -hmm. uh, the SDG manifesto for the UN. I'd like to read it to you now just to see if you can get the feeling of what it would feel like December 2030 when we reach it. Imagine a world where there is no poverty and zero hunger. We have good health and well being quality education and full gender equality everywhere. There is clean water and sanitation for everyone. Affordable and clean energy has created decent work and sustainable economic growth. Our prosperity is fueled by investments in resilient industry, innovation, and infrastructure, and that has reduced inequalities. We live in sustainable cities and communities and responsible consumption and production has healed our planet. Climate action has stopped and reversed the warming of our planet and we have flourishing life below water and abundant diverse life on land. We enjoy peace and justice through strong institutions and have built long-term partnerships for the goals. Now, the reason I wrote that is because the sustainable development goals were presented to us in the wrong way or not at all. We didn't understand if they were for cities or communities or corporations. We didn't understand how they were developed through backcasting, foresight modeling, dynamic modeling, um, through, through many tools that we've used for a long time. There's a certain amount of dollar figures behind them. Not only are they goals, but there's targets and indicators behind them to reach them. And it's really the world's first historical precedent set by humanity, just like this pandemic is the world's first global wake up call. Uh, it's the first historical precedence um, set on a global level for humanity. And it, 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 I believe it is a roadmap. The problem is people don't know about it. They don't know that vision and they don't know what it feels like if we achieve that. One last caveat I just want to say, and then I want to get your feelings and your opinions on that, mm -hmm. is that when those of us who know about them, who've heard about them, we still don't understand that it's a, it's a new global operating system. If we strive for any or all of the goals, it is not just for one nation, one country, one border. It is for all of us. And in order to do that, we actually have to change our current models and accept a new global form of governance, a new form of doing things that levels the playing field for everyone on earth, every nation on earth. And it's a, it, it's a total reset and a new operating system. Most people think that it's just a tweak on the normal. It's a little business as usual with a little couple tweaks. Well, no, it's a complete new operating system. It's new economies. It's a new way of thinking and doing things than we've ever done before. And that's what people don't really understand. They, they still think you can have nationalism, divisions and borders, and you can have nations and countries, but you can't you have to have a higher global operating system that those adhere to and still have your cultures and your borders and, and your countries. Okay. <clears throat> so I think it's extremely important um, that you wrote that manifesto because um, there's, as I said, there's a to-do list and it's missing the image and with that manifesto, um, you've created um, a vision, an image, right? So, so now there's, there's directionality. Um, but my feeling is that this is not a plan yet. And there are, um, 
I don't know, people like, you know them all, like, like Jordan Hall and uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger and uh, John Verveke and the Rebel Wisdom uh, people, Thomas Berkman. Um, and I could go on. And amazing, amazing people thinking about how that operating system might look like. But whenever I, um, and I, I, you think about that, I think about that, we, we have discussions about that. And what always comes out of that discussion for me is, um, since it's a new operating system, the power structures the, 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 will, will change. And a, a plan, a concrete plan for me would be a plan that helps the people that currently hold power, political power or financial power, to come to terms with the fact that they will lose that power and, and will give it up happily. We need to have that part of the plan. I think that's absolutely vital. This is, for example, what we're trying to do with, uh, with GITA, with the Global Impact Tech Alliance, trying to come up with an understanding that, yes, there's enormous infra infrastructure needed for that new operating system. There are sketches of the operating system. There's an image on, uh, at, at, the, at the end of it. This is the world we're creating. There's a, there's a whole framework how we, can, how we can roughly at least measure this stuff. Um, and now we need to start moving that power towards building that operating system where it will lose the power. I think that's the, and that in a peaceful, nonviolent way, that's the hardest job there, I think. That, that's why I need to tell my listeners to make sure to go over to your TEDx Frankfurt because you address some of those in, in, in your TED talk, some of those. Yes, those things, and that's so vital to, to listen to because I think then they can also get on, on the same page, um, and align with with your thoughts and some of the wisdoms that you share and have shared today. I I truly do believe that true power uh, for politicians is in the, the fact that they give it up and figure out a new global governance operating system that is probably not controlled by them, that through that vulnerability and uh, succeeding to a bigger operating system and model, and uh, one that maybe has a trustless system behind it, whether that's distributed ledger technology or machine learning or something that is not as fallible and make short term dictatorial um, decisions for a certain group uh, of, uh, of humanity that impacts the entire world, I think that would be a real step in the right direction. I'm wrapping this up now with the last question, and that is, if you could go up to all the millions of people on our earth and give them one message, a short elevator pitch message, what would it be uh, your leading words or your empowerment that you would impart to them? That's a hard question. I think I would say that um, you should try and connect deeply with your innermost fears and desires and trust in what emerges from there. Because what emerges from there will always be love. And whatever happens next will be good. Thanks, my friend. I really appreciate it, Thomas. It's been so wonderful. As always, we could talk for hours. And um, yes, too bad the restrictions are we, we won't get listeners for hours. So um, uh, thank I you. I wish bro. you all the best. Thank I'm you very me. much. And uh, we will see each other and speak very yes, soon again. Soon, soon. Yes. Thank you for being on Inside Ideas. I appreciate thank it. You. Thank you for inviting me. It's been uh, absolutely a pleasure speaking with you again. My pleasure.